and we've already got into a few questions, but yeah, I'm, I'm Josh. No guesses as to really what I'm talking about anyway. Um, but a little bit about me, just so that you don't just go away thinking, why should I listen to him? So I've worked in sleep now roughly a decade. Um, I've worked all the way from NHS, private, different private ones. I've done all the weird and the wonderful stuff. So I've put electrodes on people's heads, looked at their brain patterns, sleep staged them, helped with narcolepsy. I've worked all the way from kids to adults. I've done cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. You name it, in sleep, most of the time, I've done it, okay? That's the general gist. And if there's one thing that I want this to be for you today, it's so that you prioritize sleep a little bit more. I'm not gonna be going into like massive neurophysiology, which I know you're taking notes for, okay? But it's not something you need to take notes for. I just want you to walk away prioritizing sleep and using it as a foundation to move forward and having a little bit of an understanding why it should be a foundation. So, the question I always get asked is, do I need to? Yeah, it's a good start, really. Everyone always thinks that they are the outlier that doesn't need to sleep and those sorts of things. But, realistically, we've done it since those times. Old cavemen times and beyond. And there's a nice little quote, and I forget who says it, to be honest with you. But, if sleep wasn't needed, it is evolution's biggest mistake. Because pretty much every animal across the planet does it to some degree. We all do it slightly differently. But if we didn't need to do it, why on earth are we laying down, incapacitated, unaware of our surroundings, ready to get eaten? It must be important to some degree, realistically. And they knew it was important because they even made themselves beds out of little twigs and leaves. And we've found it, basically nests. It's not quite a temper mattress, but did the job. So even they knew it was important. And you can fast forward a little bit to the old ancient Greek times. And the reason I bring these guys up with importance is because with the old ancient Greeks, most people think of gods, okay? And surprise, surprise, they had a god for sleep. Weren't expecting a history lesson. But they had Hypnos, okay? Weirdly enough, twin brother Thanatos, god of death. So it gives you a little bit of an idea already that the ancient Greeks revered sleep, but saw it as kind of like the opposite side of the coin to death. Because to them, someone laying down, eyes closed, not moving, very, very similar. Difference being is that they also thought, as you dove down into sleep, you met one of these two at the river Lethe. Please don't correct my pronunciation if any of you are Greek. But you met them. If you met this guy, yeah, no problem, okay? You knew you were coming back, it's a return journey. Quite calm, very serene, happy about it. Meet that guy, perhaps not so much, you weren't really coming back. The reason I bring these up as well is that Hypnos was actually seen as more powerful than death. So sleep, more powerful than death to the ancient Greeks. We know that because in Homer's Iliad, if anyone's ever had a little breeze through that particular book, you'll find that it says sleep is over all mortal men and gods. Thanatos, no problem with gods, can't do anything about them. But sleep can, he had control over it. So sleep is important to them. And they use this really nice language as well. It's really poetic language about sleep. Okay, I'm not necessarily going to read it out for you. But that's the sort of language that they used to use. Sleep was massively important to them. But let's fast forward a little bit to today's world. Today's world, the language that we use is somewhat different. Um, this is long attributed to old Maggie Thatcher. Um, whether or not she said it, I don't know. Or Del Boy, if you know that one as well. Both are supposedly said it. But this is where I'm finding the problem in today's world. Sleep has become this secondary, if not tertiary thing for a lot of people that you can sacrifice for everything else. And the reason this kind of came about, this ability to put sleep in the background, on the back burner, is mainly because of the introduction of that, the light bulb, okay? We were able to all of a sudden invade the night in a way that we weren't able to before. Don't get me wrong, thought about the Industrial Revolution. Wonderful. But, whereas before, if it got dark, we stopped. 
Now, we don't, do we really? And you see it with things like podcasters and all sorts saying, money never sleeps, you've got to get up at 5 a.m. or you're not really doing the job, you're not you know, getting out there and doing as much as you can to be the powerful one. The old carpe diem, it should be carpe noctem. Okay, seize the night rather than the day, and the day will follow quite nicely. But the other one, of course, that tends to interrupt, and it's one that really we're all guilty of, is social networking as well. Okay, don't get me wrong, again, a wonderful thing, you can speak to someone across the other side of the globe, but it means that you've got access to everyone all the time. And that, again, never used to be the case. All of these things are playing against our natural instinct to sleep. And again, we're just putting it back and back and back and back. Okay? Now, why am I talking about all of these barriers? And why is sleep so important? What is it, really? Well, I'd like to try and get your opinions. If you can scan that for me. Okay? What is sleep to you? Or, you know, what do we use sleep for? What are we trying to achieve from sleep? And I'll step out of that one. And hopefully, once you write, I should start getting some answers up here. As I say, you're not going to be wrong. It's not a quiz. There we go. We've got a couple of people writing already. Wonderful. Four. Now, I think there's 11 or 12 of you, so rest and recovery, yep, reset, wonderful. Do you see everyone else? Yeah, yeah, everyone's typing. Recharge the batteries, repair, lovely. Recovery, there's a lot of recovery going on in here, being in the gym, makes sense. Stay safe. Stay safe. <laughs> By any chance? <laughs> Keep me sane, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. And guess what? You're all right, okay? You can't theoretically be wrong when we talk about this. Now, when we start looking into the actual reasons that people give, the, the old scientists giving their theories as to why we sleep, one of the first ones is that one though, energy conservation, purely to try and save on the calories. Because this up here, uses, as a percentage of weight anyway, more calories than most of the rest of your body. So when you're going to sleep, we're trying to give that a bit of a rest and hold back on some. Now, that sounds all well and good, and like a good idea, but when you find out, adjusting for everything, that you save about 200 calories in comparison to being awake, it doesn't seem like a really that much of a fair trade-off to me anyway. You've got to be asleep again, incapacitated, you're open to the environment, or at least you used to be. Anyone could come and eat you. So to save 200 calories for that, mm, not for me, might play a part. One that most of you put, restoration. Okay, so yes, we start producing things like nice hormones in the body, like human growth hormone, for instance, we produce more of when we're asleep. Repair, wonderful. Yep, nice idea, I like that one. And this is a slightly more modern approach to it anyway, is the cognitive side of things. Being able to kind of channel those synapses, make all of those little pathways we want, improve your memories so that you don't go back to the place that you stubbed your foot, things like that, okay? So all of those are reasonable. I like the last two a little bit more, but I don't think it's just one of them. I'm pretty sure that it's those and more, okay? I don't think there's necessarily one particular reason that we sleep. There's lots of processes going on. Now, the reason I say that is because if it was just one thing, we'd have a little bit of a sleep structure like I'm gonna show you. So along the bottom here, we've got time in bed. And over on the left, we've got the stage of sleep that you're gonna be in. Now, if we're doing one thing, we might expect your night to look something like that. It's called a hypnogram, okay? On, off, not doing the process, doing the sleeping process. But it doesn't look like that. Anyone know about sleep stages? You can just call out. Yeah, bit, you've probably heard of some, maybe on your Fitbit or your Apple Watch or your Whoop. 
anything like that. What we've actually got is this whack and great lot. Okay? And what actually happens through the night, if you get a really wonderful night, is something like that. We're not just diving into one, doing that for a bit, then moving on to the next process, doing that for a bit, and that's it. We cycle through. So when people talk to you about sleep cycles and things like that, what they're actually talking about is pretty much from there to there, okay? Which means we're cycling through all of these, getting to the end of it, and going about it again. But again, it doesn't even just repeat over and over. Anyone notice a vague pattern going on? You can shout out. I don't mind if you're wrong, if that's kind of the point. No, you don't have to. Yeah. We notice that a particular stage, REM for instance, starts increasing in ratio as well. Conversely, NREM3, which we're gonna talk about, starts decreasing as well. NREM3 is your deep sleep, and they always talked about the dead of night. Deep sleep, obviously, really blooming hard to wake you up. So dead of night, 12 o'clock, pretty much here, okay? Really hard to wake you up, and if you wanted to murder someone, do it there, okay? Really, really challenging for them to wake up if you're trying to strangle them at that point. Much easier in the latter half of the night. Don't do it at 3, 4 a.m., okay? So that's what it looks like. Now, that's all we're going to be saying about all of those stages. What do they actually mean, really? Well, these are the percentages of them, okay? We don't spend much in one at all, really. We spend a huge whacking great lot in two, and then a similar-ish amount, traditionally anyway, in REM and in REM 3. Again, still probably won't necessarily mean a lot to you at the moment. But when you start looking on your Apple stuff and it says, oh, you spent such and such in REM and deep sleep, you'll start going, mm, okay, that kind of matches up with what I mean. But what do they mean? NREM 1, this is transition from wake to sleep. It's like getting in your car on a journey. It's a very short period. And what you see with the brain patterns is the brain patterns start to reduce, they become a lot more quiet and they slow right down. We're drifting off. This is where sometimes people might wake up with a bit of a, a start, a bit of a jerk, okay? Because there's probably been something changing in the external environment or internally that's caused you to start and wake up. But don't spend long in here at all before all of a sudden we switch into stage two. Stage two, a bit more interesting. We start seeing things like K-complexes, which are these big upticks and down in those brain patterns, and these little sleep spindles that come through, which might be to do with memory consolidation, or so we think. But the K-complexes we see there is a little bit like, for instance, just making sure your environment's still safe, popping your head from behind a hedge, popping back down again. So if a little bit of a noise went off in the background, K-complex would check to make sure that it's not carrying on and you've not got a tiger coming to eat you. No, you're safe, back down into stage two you go. So it's a protective mechanism as well to try and help you transverse onto the highway that is NREM3. Deep sleep, delta wave sleep, slow wave sleep, call it what you want, okay? NREM3 is where some of the good stuff starts happening, okay? In here, this is where, as I say, you start getting things like human growth hormone starts being produced and we get various other hormones released. In here, we get a nice wash of the brain from our glymphatic system. Anyone know what that is? Yeah, wonderful. Glymphatic system, basically nice reduction in all the blood flow in the brain, replaced with cerebrospinal fluid, and it washes away all of those daily plaques that might then lead to things like Alzheimer's in the future. But also, we get memory consolidation. We know that because of a nice little study on rats, okay? Don't get me wrong, we're not quite the same, but it does the same job. There's this little study looked at them going through a maze, and you might even have heard of this study, I don't know. But the rats went through a maze. And as they've reached specific points, they were measuring their brain waves. If they got to a good point, they assigned a little noise, ping. And then by the time they got to the end, it was ping, ping, ping. Great. They then looked at what was happening when they fell asleep and went into this, oh, or their version of this. What happened was, guess. 
Someone? Yeah, we heard ping, 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 in exactly the same way, riding those brain waves. The same noise was assigned. What was the difference, though? Anyone care to hazard a guess? Yeah. Ten times faster. Pring, pring, pring. It means that they were consolidating that memory much faster and much better than when you're awake. So when those rats came back the next day, as if they had a choice, they came back and went through that maze, <laughs> I know, um, they went exactly the right route. Didn't take a wrong turn. And it's because we consolidate memories in sleep as well, from short term to long term. So NREM free, wonderful, we want more of that. REM, more enjoyable stuff. REM sleep, dream sleep, most people think of it as. Now, technically speaking, you can dream in all stages. But REM, this is where your vivid imagery starts coming on. But we do also lose all muscle tone so that we don't act it out and kill our partner next to us. Incidentally, some legal cases genuinely around that, except the person in question supposedly got out of their bed, down the street, and killed their uh, mother-in-law, I think it was. I don't know if we can blame Rem on that, to be honest with you. Um, but there have been genuine cases where people act out a dream, but they don't act on anything in the external environment. So they're just acting out what's happening up here. Anyone ever suffer from sleep paralysis at all? Yeah? Horrible, yeah. Reason being, you've woken up from REM, but in the wrong way, you've gone through the gears wrong. Okay, so this has woken up, these have woken up, body's still asleep. Okay, all of those muscles are still complete atonia, without tone. And it means that all of a sudden your brain's going, why is this happening? So lots of people will start thinking, oh, can I see something out of the corner of my eye? D what did you experience? Anything particular? Panic, Panic yeah. <laughs> lots of people weirdly report the same thing, which is this kind of weird little witch lady monkey that sits on someone's chest, a homunculus. Weird, I know, but they all report the same thing in different walks of the world as well. Odd. But lots of people report that sort of thing, something out of the corner of your eye, panic is certainly one of them. But as soon as you get control over even a little finger, you're free, because the brain understands that in actual fact, you are awake now. A good part about it, though, I've said a lot of bad parts about REM, a good part about it is it's like doing, a, it's your eureka part, if you like. It's like doing a Google search and searching on page 16 for the answer. It will find an answer roughly for you that you would never have found. It's your problem solving part. So when people talk about going to sleep on a problem or with a problem as the French say, REM will do that job and it will find little pathways and connect up with its little spider webs in your brain to say, oh, that's actually quite a good solution that you wouldn't have thought of. Let's connect that pathway. So when you wake up, it's not like you wake up and go, oh, wow, I've found the answer but you might later find that, why didn't I think of that? That's probably what I should have done in the first place. And there's these kind of historical parts of you know, Einstein waking up with this eureka moment about it. There's Beethoven supposedly doing a symphony in his dream, those sorts of things. It's based off of this, okay? All embellished just a tad. But that's your stages, okay? And we go through them completely differently. Now, how long? Do we need to sleep to get them? How long should we sleep, roughly? Seven to nine hours. Thank you very much. Do we know why? Uh, no. no? It's because 95% of the population, that is what meets 100% of their sleep requirement. Simple as that. That's why we recommend seven to nine, and that's where your original eight hours came from. So if we look at this, okay, Let's, let's go around. Last, last night, how much did we get? Six. Six and a half? Six? Eight? Good. <laughs> Lovely. Seven? Six and a half? Eight? Wonderful. Yeah? Brilliant. Um, 
Now, realistically, the answers you've given aren't wrong. Okay, seven to nine hours, as I say, is because of this. That's your population. And in the middle there is where most people sit in terms of what their requirement is. Now, does it mean that you are in that? No, not necessarily. Okay, you may well get away with six and a half, six. It becomes slightly less um, apparent as soon as you start dipping below the six mark. Okay, if you go below that, pushing your luck a tad in terms of what you think you need. But similarly, we don't want to have too much sleep. If you do a lot of physical exercise and train a lot, you do need a bit more because what you'll need is more of that deep stage three sleep for a lot of repair. Okay, so 10 hours for yourself in actual fact makes quite a bit of sense. Okay, but traditionally most people sit in there. Okay, simple as that. Now what happens if you don't? That's what most people want to know. What happens if I don't sleep enough? Well, in the context of being in a gym, that goes up. Weight, typically. And it doesn't mean just because you don't sleep, all of a sudden you end up with a belly. All it means is we get changes in our hormones tend to occur. So with poor sleep, what we see is an increase in ghrelin. That's the one that makes you feel hungry. And a decrease in leptin. That's the one that makes you feel full. So poor sleep. We are hungry and never full. Have a guess, roughly anyway, how many more calories an average person compared to someone with poor sleep the difference might be. So if you've got poor sleep, how many more calories across the average person might you consume per day? 400. 400? It's a big range, that's cheating. Um, <laughs> 600? From experience, yeah, yeah. From, from experience, yeah, it definitely can be. You might be at the slightly extreme end of the scale. Um, but three, 400 calories is about right, on average, per day of poor sleep. But you wouldn't think it because as soon as you, we kind of vaguely talked about it, as soon as you step into chronic sleep deprivation, our ability to understand that and our reduction in all of our performance takes a plummet. We all know when we've had a rubbish night's sleep, at least one, but we're not very good at noticing when we've got poor sleep over a long period of time. Really nice little study on this again. They had two groups. Both did a little reaction test on the computer. Space bar, click it whenever it comes up. Really easy. They go through, both groups did exactly the same test, same time in the morning. Okay, gone through, got the results, wonderful. Group one, they sent away and said, you aren't allowed to sleep tonight. Come back the next morning, do the test. Came back next morning, did the test. How do you think they did? Yeah, yeah, rubbish, not very good. They asked them, how well do you think they did? And they went, it's not very good, I'm absolutely shattered. Group two, they took away the same amount of time, so roughly eight hours from them, but they did it over the course of the week. So they took away an hour here, two hours there, that sort of thing. Now, those people did the test again the next morning after all of that. How do we think they did? Right. Yeah, just as bad. Just as bad as the people in group one. How do we think they did in terms of what their perception was? They thought they'd done the same. Yeah, they thought their performance was still right up at 100%. No, it was not, okay? This is the reason why poor sleep in general leads to things like road traffic accidents a lot more. Over 150,000 in America last year, um, and that's probably underestimated. So not great, and that's why the DBMA will get onto you with sleep conditions and things like that. How we got onto that from weight, I don't know. Um, but other context of gym. Your muscles, protein synthesis, human growth hormone, all happens wonderful periods during sleep. Don't get it? guess what, they go, or they don't grow as much as you would want them to. In terms of just general elite sport, well, jumping power, gone, peak performance, gone, strength tests, gone, reaction times, gone, all down to poor sleep, okay? So yes, I appreciate we might not necessarily have a lot of elite sportsmen in the group, but it can have a big, big impact on that as well. Um, and yes, at that level, we're talking one, 2% makes a huge difference between first and second or third. If 
for yourselves, the percentages may actually be quite a bit different. So it might be 10 to 15 percent. OK, so important in terms of what you're doing here as well. Cardiac health, poor sleep in general again, not good for that. Increase in cardiovascular disease, stroke, you name it. Now, there's a nice little test that we do every single year on this. What do we do? What happens every single year? No, but I do like the thinking. Right lines. Every single year. Birthday, it's different for everyone. It happens on the same day every year. Same day every year. What happens? Yes. Clocks go forward. We lose an hour's sleep. What happens the next day? 20% rise in heart attacks. Oh, yeah. Okay. One hour loss. That's all it takes. And we see more beyond that, more road traffic accidents, as I mentioned, surgical mistakes, all manner of things, one hour less of sleep. And it's usually because those people are already towing the line. So taking an hour away from them just puts them at more risk. But huge, huge changes from one hour loss. That's how important it is. Cognitive side of things, I've kind of said about it, particularly with things like surgical mistakes but also psychological health. So mental health in general, there is a reciprocal relationship. You can always think about, again, a time you've had a poor night's sleep. You're not going to be your own favourite person the next day, and we all get a little bit moody. But anxiety, depression, massive links to poor sleep, but also affect sleep in, inside it as well. So often those sorts of people need to have a little bit of cognitive coaching a lot of the time to improve the sleep, to give that platform to move forward as well. Um, and we can also talk about things like neurodevelopmental disorders as well come into this reciprocal relationship with sleep as well. So it's not just physical, if you like. What's that one? None of you have seen that emoji before. <laughs> you, are, you are all lying. Thank you very much. Sexual health in general. Um, testosterone drops. So. If next time you see someone with reasonably small testicles, ask them if they're sleeping particularly well. Um, because what we do tend to find is that with poor sleep in general, we see someone's testosterone level about 10 years their senior. Huge. We also see erectile dysfunction in men and low libido in women. Just through, again, poor sleep in general. Okay, And that can just be poor sleep practices. It doesn't have to be a disorder. And just to really finish on a high, death. Poor sleep in general increases the risk of all-cause mortality, okay? So poor sleep, if you don't focus on it, it increases your risk of everything. Shall I end it there? No. Um, so, you know, that's, that's wonderful. But there are barriers to preventing people from doing all of this. So I'm going to ask you again, okay? What are the barriers to you achieving it then? You can blame the kids. I don't, I don't typically put them on there, but uh, you can try. Stress, yeah, temperature. Usually you just hear when people talk about the sleep, the members. The members drop down. Like, if I just want someone to sleep, they can sleep for me. Yeah. Immediately yeah. I assume when we're talking about things like women's health, it will be like menst menstrual changes, those sorts of things. Yep, yeah, menopause is up there, wonderful. FOMO. <laughs> Snoring partner, yeah, people don't think about the sociological side of that as well. Look how many people are writing anxiety as well, stress and anxiety. Okay. Bigger because more people are the same thing. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Massive, massive things. It goes back to what I just said about mental health. Okay. There is that constant vicious cycle of poor sleep, stress, causing poor sleep, causing more stress, and we keep going. And a lot of the time it's because we don't implement the right practices when we're going to sleep as well. Um, we can try our best and I'm not going to be puritanical about it. I'm not going to say you must go home and do this. It's just about putting sleep, as I say, on a bit of a pedestal and saying, right, I'm going to do most of the things that I can do to try and facilitate better sleep because it's going to help with these sorts of things as well. OK, so yes, they are barriers, but they are outcomes as well. And our ability to deal with 
every single one of these things comes back to sleeping well as well. Lots of the time, as I say, it's that reciprocal relationship. Okay. So I just wanted to know, that, yeah, look, phone's down the bottom as well. You're all liars. That should have been one of the biggest ones on there. Okay. And I've got some myself. Okay. You've said most of them, realistically. I tend to, I don't need put kids on here, but kids probably come under stress um, and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, it all comes back to it. So that's the question really, isn't it? If, you know, that's all the bad stuff. What can I really do that's going to make a little bit of a difference? Schedules, okay? The more you can stick to a schedule, the better, okay? And it means having a routine. It means, and you'll all hate me when I say it, not necessarily sleeping in at a weekend, even though that's the only time you've got. The more you can stick to a schedule, the more your body is going, or your, more so your brain, is going to understand, okay, it is bedtime, I am tired now. And it also means making the bedroom the environment that you need it to be. It is for sleep and sex, that is it. TV's out the room, those sorts of things, okay? We need to make sure when we walk into that environment, that's a sleeping environment. It's not where I'm gonna sit on my phone. It's not necessarily where I'm gonna watch, uh, was it Married at First Sight? If you've all left, and I get caught up in it. Okay, so schedule, routine, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, but giving yourself enough opportunity where possible. Food. Now, I'm not saying go to bed hungry, okay, because in actual fact, it has the opposite effect, you'll wake up hungry. But eating too close to bed, this is what we would normally refer to as a zeit giver or time giver, okay? It tells your body, I'm eating, therefore it must be daytime and I must be awake. That's the message it's giving. And don't get me wrong, then when we start digesting, not particularly great we're falling asleep for, particularly if we get things like acid reflux, but it's more so the action, okay? When we start eating, we're telling the body that we should be awake. Two hours before bed, ideally. Caffeine, okay? I'm not gonna take away anyone's coffee, that's fine. But realistically, you want to try and have it early. You want to stop somewhere around about the midday region and then perhaps switch to other hot drinks. Um, again, I'm not gonna take it away from you. If you're a six cups kind of person, it's highly unlikely you're gonna go home and go, oh, I'm not having any anymore, because you'll wake up with a headache. But all this is really doing is blocking bits in your brain that would normally be the sleep neurotransmitters coming in to say, you are tired, you are tired, you are tired. They're kind of like the bouncer standing there going, no, 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 you're, you're not. So you can actually consume as much coffee as you like. There is an affinity point where it won't make a difference. It's just placebo beyond that, okay? All of the entrances are blocked. And it takes about mm, six to eight hours to wash out from your system roughly. It's got a four hour half-life, so by the time you get to about a quarter of a cup, you're doing all right, it's still swishing about. But think about, you know, if you have one at, let's say, 4 p.m. thinking you're okay, and that's still in your body eight hours later, midnight, you've still got a cup of coffee. Not really when you should be drinking coffee. I'm not going to take any anyone's alcohol. You can do what you like. In actual fact, I'm going to tell you, drink it in the morning. It's five o'clock somewhere. Okay, alcohol, again, you all know what it's gonna be like to have a drink and your sleep is not the best. It will put you to sleep, it will get you there, but what you then find is that as it wears off through the night, your sleep becomes incredibly fragmented. And it also suppresses that lovely REM that we want. Alcoholics, in actual fact, once they go, to, for instance, to AA, all of a sudden you find they start reporting, oh, I've had this massive vivid dreams recently. And it's because the brain's gone, oh, finally, REM, we can throw it at them. And it's all because they've stopped drinking and they've stopped suppressing their REM. So again, this can have massive effects on that. So alcohol, ideally, before 12 p.m., okay? If you're gonna go away with something, that's the one. Light, okay, light in general, Biggest Zeitgeber, which is what? No, you're listening. Time giver. Biggest time giver there is. This is what we have evolved around. This is to do with our circadian rhythm. 
This is what tells us night and day. Simple as that. So if you are having a screen here, then you are essentially trying to say to your body, it's daytime, okay? And it will suppress certain little hormones, one called melatonin, which I'm not gonna go on about too much, but that's one of the ones that just helps lull you into sleep. It's not a hypnotic, but people that wanna take it, melatonin doesn't put you to sleep. It's not what it does. And people take it all wrong, sorts of wrong ways. If you get given or offered melatonin for a sleep problem, ask them why, and then say, how am I meant to take it? Because if they tell you to take it just before bedtime, wrong. Simple as that. You should be taking it about two to four hours before you actually want to try and fall asleep. That's where people go wrong with melatonin. But light in general, in your bedroom, dark as possible. Again, environment for sleep. We want to tell your body it is bedtime. Reduce that as much as possible. Temperature, okay? Somebody actually mentioned it earlier as well. Temperature in general, if you're too hot, you're gonna struggle to sleep and you're gonna struggle to sleep well. Not particularly easy in this environment, don't get me wrong. Nice to have a nice bit of air con. Um, but realistically, temperature, what happens is, as we dive into sleep, our core body temperature takes a plummet. So we want to really kind of mimic that. People might have referred to you in the past and said, look, a little bit of a warm shower, warm bath before bed, it's really, really good because it raises all the capillaries to the surface. And as soon as you get out, it dumps heat. And we drop our core body temperature, and it's like saying to your body, oh, you should probably be asleep if this is happening. So that's what we want to do. Nice room about anywhere between about 14 to 17 degrees, if you can really target it, but as cool as possible. Again, in this environment, it's really difficult. So when it's really hot, hot and particularly sunny, particularly if it comes into your bedroom side, Everyone wants to have their windows open during the day. Don't. What you'll find is you're allowing that warm air to enter your house and essentially warm up your room. What you want to do is close the blinds if you've got them or curtains so that those rays can't come in and you want the window closed. When it's nighttime, you can open them because there'll be a nice bit of cool air, hopefully, coming in. All right, so nice cool room. And that's kind of it, really. I think we're bang on time. Um, so. Pretty much so. So I'm just going to switch to yeah, far away second the microphone questions. so people can, if you have I'm a question. I'm looking, just... I'm looking forward to whatever the weirdest one's going to be. I can start with a question, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, two questions. First, I asked you before, um, what do you think of the nose strip and the mouth tape? No, nose strips, do what you like. Um, they have very, very little effect um, other than a placebo, which in itself does work. Mouth taping, I am for sleep against. Okay, I, am, I can't make that any more apparent. I am against mouth taping when, taping when asleep. During the day, fine. Helps you focus on nasal breathing. And if this did get blocked, you are conscious enough to take that off. Asleep, you're not. And don't get me wrong, you will probably be able to force it open. It's just not good practice okay yeah okay great uh second for the temperature i've seen those mattresses grounding mattr uh, oh, mattress yeah. covers that you can regulate temperature have you, you got have a spare a... four and a half thousand pounds oh they, they're, <laughs> they're some of some a bit cheaper i'm actually some, considering some that that yeah. you have two zone sort of temperature yeah so Which, is that something you would yeah realistically so if there's something that can regulate temperature quite nicely like that, and for instance, most people talk about Sleep 8, which is one of the ones that does um, the pods that sit there, and it's like veins in your, your cover, basically, that take away heat and put it out into the pod. It's actually really, really good. Um, I say the problem is bloody expensive. Is, is um, that because I was thinking of that, is that 4.5K? Yeah. Okay, yeah, probably not. <laughs> um, yeah. Very, very expensive stuff. Um, very, very good though. Right, uh, that's enough questions for me. Anyone, anyone else? Then Andrew. How do you know? Sorry. Now we're talking, I, sorry. Teresa can't be my luck. <laughs> How do you know if you've got sleep apnea? Realistically, there are a lot of symptoms that you can look for. The traditional one is obviously snoring, okay? Then we start looking at other things though that people don't think about. Daytime sleepiness. Can you fall asleep at your desk? Can you fall asleep watching a bit of TV in the evening? Chances are you're sleep deprived. 
Do you have to pop to the loo regularly in the night? Another symptom. Do you wake up with morning headaches? Another symptom. Do you have re regular mood changes through the day? Another symptom. It can be any of those. And if you want to try and find out, what you really need to do is get a cardiorespiratory sleep study, okay? You, there are disposable ones on the market these days, but also if you go to your local practitioner, be that a GP or consultant, they should be able to offer you an at-home sleep study. So you can do it in the space of your own home. It goes back, you'll have little bands here and here. You have a little nasal cannula that sits under there and looks at the airflow in and out. And you'll have a little cap that sits on your finger, which is looking at your oxygen monitoring. And it will look at how many times you are pausing in breathing, not for want of what you need, through the night. Um, and it's people like me that look at it, to be honest with you. So yeah, you can get that done quite easy. Does that answer it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, did it answer it? Oh, cardio, I'll just call it a sleep study. It's, they'll know exactly what you mean. <laughs> Can I ask two questions as well, please? Yeah. <laughs> My first one is, that 20 minute perfect nap time, mm -hmm. is that true? Yes. But you're gonna say don't nap, aren't With you? With caveats. Oh. I'm, I'm very pro napping, oh. um, unless it affects your bedtime sleep. Okay, if you are napping and it encroaches upon you being able to fall asleep that evening, I would rather you didn't nap. Right. Um, that said, if it doesn't and you require a nap to function, please nap. Okay. Mm. The reason that there's that 20 minute window is because, you know, I said about kind of diving down into stages. If you leave it too long, you'll end up in that deep stage of sleep and you will wake up feeling worse than when you went to sleep. Okay. So 20 minutes is your rough idea. Easiest way to do it, and they used to do it this way, hold like something like a spoon in your hand, because as soon as you drop it, you have gone into a deeper stage of sleep and you'll wake up feeling all right. Hmm. How do you know you dropped it? Sorry? How do you know you dropped it? How do you know you dropped it? It makes a noise. Unless you're dropping it on carpet, in which case I can't help you. Um, <laughs> but usually setting an alarm around about a 20 minute mark is, yeah, rough, but it is an estimate. Um, so don't be too surprised if occasionally on 20 minutes, if you are sleep deprived, you mm. do wake up in deep sleep. It can happen. Interesting. My other one was, if you have, so from that chart, mm -hmm. if you have really vivid dreams frequently, does that mean that you're not sleeping as well? No. So what it might mean though, is that if you're remembering a lot of dreams or you're waking up to a lot of dreams, mm. um, is it through the night or is it just at the end? No. Okay, so, as I say, more REM in the early stages of the morning, yeah. so you're more likely to catch yourself in that period. Mm -hmm. So, but if you've got an alarm or something external or internal has woken you in that, mm -hmm. you will remember your dream, initially anyway. Usually that fades over the day. Mm -hmm. But normally if you remember a dream, it's because you've woken up in REM. Okay, right, I actually have two questions if that's oh. okay. <laughs> Two questions, if that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, number one, what would you advise someone to do as a first step to, uh, like, help them switch off? Because I'm the type of person that, for the most part, I do sometimes struggle to switch off. Yeah. Sometimes. So, when you say switch off, I assume you mean psychologically. Yeah, because uh, I, think, I think, for me, it first started probably a few years ago when I moved into management. Okay. And it's like, even when... Like these days, I hardly take breaks like while I was at work. But even when I do, I'm still like on my phone checking emails. Uh, my office phone comes through on my mobile. So if it rings, I'm answering it while I was on break. You know what break. I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you've, you've answered it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, fair Again, enough. I can't force you to do any of that, but it's about setting boundaries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Remember I talked about kind of schedule and routine. Yeah. You need to, ideally anyway, set yourself a cutoff point. Right. Okay, where you go, I know it's on that phone, but after this time, that is it. It goes on do not disturb. Yeah. Something along those lines. And as, as I say, you can ta taper that off. You don't have to go home this evening and go, no one's talking to me from 8 p.m. onwards. Because mm -hmm. I realize that that's not necessarily possible for you. But yeah, there needs to be something there that you say, right, no more of that. The other side of it, of course, is if there are kind of stresses and anxieties and worries usually for the next day for a lot of people, particularly in management, 
usually something like giving yourself 10, 20 minutes where you just write down those problems before right. you go to bed, please, not mm -hmm. in the bedroom, before you go to bed, you've given yourself the time to worry about them before going into the environment where you should be resting. The okay. issue that we find is that people leave all of their stresses and worries till they get in bed, and guess what? The bed becomes a stressful, anxious place. Mm. Okay, so yeah, just write it down before. Okay, thank you. That's all right. Uh, uh, last question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned it's important to get between seven and nine hours sleep. Yeah. Would you also say that uh, the time you sleep during the day, does that have a, an effect on your sleep as well? Not only the amount? So it more, has more so an effect on your onset of sleep in the evening, so the amount of time it takes you to fall asleep. If it doesn't, chances are, as I say, number one, you are sleep deprived. But does it count towards your kind of overall arching total? Yes, it can. Okay, but again, ideally they need to be structured naps if you're going to use them right. um, and not too close to bedtime. So if you're setting yourself a nap, I'm going to have 20 minutes here, or I know that today I can set aside like an hour or so where I'm going to give myself proper rest, mm -hmm. do it properly. Don't just sit in your chair on the desk and go like that, okay? Give yourself the time. Go and lay down, set the alarm for the period that you want to wake up, do it properly. Okay. So. Yeah, cool. With like deep sleep and stuff, is yeah. there too much time you can spend in it? Because like deep sleep to me sounds like a somewhere that I want to spend a lot of time in just because of like the recovery benefits of it. Well, the good news is you have very little choice over how much you get, <laughs> okay? The only thing that you can really start changing the amount of deep sleep you get, typically anyway, is physical activity, okay? What you'll see is that you can actually adjust the amount you get because your body prioritizes that, or your brain does anyway. It says, you've done a lot of work today that's quite damaging to your muscles. We need to allocate some time to repair that. And so you'll actually increase the amount of deep sleep that you get. But other than that, just be aware, your brain is a bloody good accountant. It knows what you owe as a general rule. So the sleep stages that you go through, unless there is an underlying problem, of course, are the ones you need. It's just about providing the opportunity to have them. Okay? Is that? Yeah. Cool? Yeah? That's cool. I'll just take one more question. We've got a session in five minutes. So, um, Great. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome.